All right, uh, I think we've got a good number of people signed on, so we'll get started. So welcome to the third in a series of Cirrus Link webinars. Today, we'll explain how to create a secure, redundant, and highly available MQTT environment that will provide your business with a superior OT solution and enable your digital transformation. My name is Chris Houghton, and I will be serving as the moderator today. With me is Arlen Nipper, President and CTO of Cirrus Link, and co-inventor of MQTT, the lightweight publish subscribe messaging protocol. Also with us today is Kurt Hockenedel, Sales and Marketing Director of Cirrus Link. First, a little background about Cirrus Link solutions. Founded in 2012 by Arlen and myself, we have over 75 man years of experience in-house implementing solutions using MQTT. Our MQTT modules enable the Ignition platform to connect OT data to IT services for big data analytics while providing a superior OT solution. We are one of only two strategic partners to inductive automation who created the Ignition platform for SCADA and MES. We have extensive experience in designing and implementing MQTT solutions. So we've seen all of the challenges and concerns that people typically have about using this technology and solved them previously on actual projects. In this hour, we'll start with a brief review of the Service Link modules and where they fit into a system architecture. Then we'll move on to a review of the MQTT basics to refresh everybody on the mechanics of MQTT. We'll look at some typical architectures to show how this works in real world applications and explain how to set up an MQTT architecture that is secure has redundancy and therefore is highly available using our MQTT modules for Ignition Platform and also using our standalone MQTT server chariot. Next, we'll have a live demo showing how simple it is to set up and configure the MQTT environment to see the reliability and availability of a system during a failover caused by simulated catastrophic failure and see how quickly the system self heals and recovers. At the end, we'll wrap things up with a Q&A session. So if you have any questions as we go through the presentation, please post them in the chat window and we'll answer as many as possible at the end. And any questions we cannot get to, we'll follow up directly with you after the presentation. So without further delay, I'd like to hand over to Kurt Hockenedel to get us started. So over to you, Kurt. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> so in reviewing the modules, we'll first start with the three core MQTT modules that run on the Ignition platform. The first one is where the, I'd say, data producers are at the edge. It's called the MQTT transmission module. Its main purpose is to transform any Ignition tag data into MQTT spark plug data. It runs on Ignition for full-blown full systems of you know, many thousands of tags, and also comes as a standard piece of the Ignition Edge MQTT software when you purchase that license. It has built-in store and forward capabilities for when if you lose communications or if a network, if a server goes down or if the primary host Ignition goes down. It also utilizes report by exception capabilities where you can reduce bandwidth over MQTT anywhere between 85 and 95 percent. And it has the features of publishing the data, so it's self-discovery and self-learning for the different data consumers, as well as it provides the metadata of tags that's being published, meaning the scaling, the engineering units, the high, the low. And with Ignition 8, you can add custom properties to the tag information to tie to like asset ID or other properties that may be included in the tags. The second module is the MQTT distributor module. This is a 3.1.1 Oasis compliant MQTT server that runs as a module on Ignition or Ignition Edge. It can be used as a standalone product for standalone systems if all you wanna have is the function of an MQTT server with the Ignition license. It provides easy way to configure security, clients, connectivities, and the ACLs in which they connect on. And for larger systems, like with, Chris was discussing, we have a chariot system that goes beyond the 250 edge clients that distributor maximizes at that runs on Ignition. The last module is the MQTT engine module. 
This again runs on ignition or ignition edge, and its main purpose is to transform the ignition or the tag information from spark plug into ignition tags. So any producers that are producing spark plug data, this will subscribe to that information, will have the auto discovery functionality to create the tags with an ignition, create all the properties of those tags, and provide the capability to connect to MQT servers with all the security alone into it as well. So if we're looking at the architecture of these different components, we'll start with the MQT server, which is where the different host clients or edge clients connect into. And then on the left side, you have a host client. This is where the, the hub or the central connection point of your MQTT applications data goes to. And then the right-hand side, we have the different edge clients. So if we're looking at the modules, you have the transmission module that can be plugged into ignition of which an ignition system can be sitting in front of a factory floor that has can have hundreds of thousands of tags um, or a few. And then you have the ignition edge MQTT product that is used for a lot of remote applications or you know tying to oil and gas, wastewater, anything that has remote capabilities or just tying to some spurious IO and a factory floor that might not have connectivity to, it plugs into those assets. And then those connect into the MQT distributor module to which your central hub application of plat uh, on ignition will connect with MQTT engine. So something else that, uh, that we've done, especially for enterprise type solutions, is we've built some cloud injector modules for ignition. Uh, the Google injector, the AWS injector, the IBM injector, and the Azure injector. These modules do not require MQTT from a standpoint of having, you know, an MQTT architecture. This, this runs on any ignition platform that's currently in place. And this is basically bridging the gap between OT and IT. It will connect to any tag data and it's very easy to configure. If you have an existing ignition platform, you can install one of these modules, you know, in several minutes. And if you have the endpoint uh, strings to connect to the different cloud and platforms, you can start sending you know, data to the cloud as a standardized approach within minutes. This is, you know, has the same reporting, efficient tag reporting scheme as a transmission module in the sense that it's doing report by exception. It also is very efficient in the sense that as you are having a bunch of changes that are happening, it concatenate those into a one message packet send. So you're not sending in lots of small messages getting charged uh, a, a larger amount of money. It's trying to make it as cost efficient as possible, sending all the tag change events into maximized packet sizes. Again, this will work on ignition or ignition edge. And again, these are used for the applications such as predictive maintenance, um, you know, big data analytics, the digital twins, putting data in data lakes. So a lot of our enterprise customers are utilizing these tools from a central ignition standpoint to send all the data to a central point and then provide this data as a push and a standardized approach into these services. And lastly, the some new modules we had come out this year um, addressing the EFM market for oil and gas. We delivered a EFM Emerson Rock protocol driver module for the Emerson Rock and Rock Plus flow computers. This works on the Flow Boss 100 and 800 series. This runs on Ignition and Ignition Edge. It has any access to any TLP and custom user programs. It supports the alarms, the configs, the events, the minute history, periodic history, and daily history of these flow computers to have that data accessible by Ignition or Ignition Edge. And it works in conjunction with the MQTT transmission module to send the record data of these events, of those records, into the MQT architecture and be consumed by ignition at the central hub location. The second module that works in conjunction with the Emerson Rock driver is the EFM export module. This connects that EFM record data to you know, the leading measurement software pro program called FlowCal. Typically, what has been done in the market is that people use CFX files, they have, uh, I don't know, Matron, Autosol, 
uh, Kepler pulling these devices and you know over network links and, and creating CFX files and then pushing those across. Now with MQTT and the Emerson Rock Driver, this is automatic. This data flows from the edge, publishes those records into the FM export, and then this sends the data through transaction queues directly into FlowCal um, automatically with security on top of it. And then the other module that works with EFM, but also works you know, not using EFM, is called the MQTT re Recorder Module. But this automatically generates tables and populate rows from records that are being published from the Edge applications. This could be from Emerson Rock Driver as the event data. This includes security hash marks on that record data. So when it's being published, you have authentication of the validation of that data. It also creates a new row, new records as new, new records come in that haven't been sent before. It automatically adds new columns if required when records contain new items and populates new rows. And provides an audit check tool so once you have the records and have the hash of the actual, you know, the record being sent, you can actually run a tool on it to validate that the record hasn't been modified or changed within Ignition. And with that, after covering these modules, I'll now pass on to Arlen to talk about MQTT. Thank you very much, Kurt. Appreciate that. <clears throat> so first we'll start with what is MQTT? Uh, just kind of a, a quick you know, review in a background. And MQTT sits in that software application area that's started probably 25, 30 years ago within IT. And we first, we called it Service Oriented Architectures or SOA. Uh, today we call that Enterprise Service Buses, but all of those technologies basically are implementing a thing called Message Oriented Middleware. And that lets you decouple applications from each other by one application publishing an interesting piece of information, another application can subscribe to that. And using publish and subscribe, we get this architecture where we're not hard coding one application to another. So now let's put that in context of what we're talking about in operational SCADA uh, DCS type technology. Our goal here is to decouple those devices that we have in the field from one any one application. And we use message oriented middleware to do that. So I will say that MQTT, although it has become the dominant IoT, IIoT transport that all the cloud providers support, and you see it everywhere, including Facebook, it was originally designed on a project for Philips 66 to help them better utilize very limited VSAT space segments. So the criteria that we used was, first of all, it had to be simple. We had, you know, 8-bit microprocessors with 64K of memory. So we were very constrained on, you know, what type of software we could put out into the field. Number two, to Kurt's point, is it had to be efficient. We had to use as little bandwidth footprint as possible. And we've proven in the last 22 years that we've been doing MQTT, if we replace a poll response protocol with MQTT, like for like, in other words, the same registers at the same update rate, we're looking at an 80 to 95% bandwidth reduction for the same amount of data. Now, the third thing that's very unique for MQTT is that we also realize that if we are going to do real-time mission critical command and control SCADA systems, that this infrastructure had to be stateful. In other words, say for example, on Phillips 66, if I've got 800 booster stations along 12,000 miles of pipeline, and I need to be able to open and control, open and close valves and turn pumps on and off, I need to know that those endpoints are out there and they're ready to receive commands or they are sending me data as it changes in the field. So that's the unique standpoint of MQTT has what we call continuous session awareness, so that I know in real time the state of all of my nodes that are connected into my in infrastructure. And lastly, and this was as, uh, working with IBM, this was a challenge to say the least in the late 1990s, is that at the time we knew this had to be open. It had to be a specification that anybody could download and implement. And if we didn't do that, it was never going to take off. And to, to that point, you know, we look at this and we look at this whole notion of the industrial Internet of Things, and we're going on six or seven years now of people saying, oh, it's going to take off, it's going to take off. But it hasn't exploded 
like the Internet of People did. If we look at why the Internet of People took off, it was for really two things. There was a transport out there that was publicly available called HTTP. Once that was out there, somebody came along and said, you know, we should represent the data that's being sent in these HTTP messages, and we'll do the hypertext markup language, HTML. And with those two things, with a transport and a data representation, the Internet of People took off to the point that we know it today. Now, along the lines there, 10, 12 years ago, there was this notion of the Internet of Things, and MQTT was being used for that sensors, smart home automation systems, garage door openers. But the fact is, is that everybody were doing the payload definition and the topic namespace differently. So there was, there was no way to leverage that. That wasn't going to take off and explode like the Internet of People did. But if we fast forward to today where we've got MQTT, it's available, highly available, and now we've got a specification called Sparkplug. And Sparkplug, lets us standardize that so that we can leverage into the same uh, uh, explosive growth in the industrial Internet of Things as we saw in the Internet of People. So a little bit of a timeline again, you know, the creation of MQTT in 1999 on a project with Philips 66, and it just kind of stayed, you know, kind of quiescent within IBM for many, many years. And then in 2011, a blog came out explaining how Facebook had used MQTT for their Facebook Messenger and all the advantages and the efficiencies and how quickly they were able to put together Facebook Messenger, which led to people looking at it in the 2012 timeframe. We got the PAHO project into the Eclipse Software Foundation. And I will say that probably 99% of everybody using MQTT probably went to the Eclipse Foundation and started with something from PAHO to get started. Then in 2014, we finally got MQTT. We realized we needed to get it into the international standards bodies that went through the OASIS and the IEEE. Uh, and then up to that point in 2016, CirrusLink found this company called Inductive Automation that had a really cool application platform, an industrial application platform that we could leverage and take all this knowledge that we had about MQTT and actually write something that did, did useful things for SCADA and for operational systems. Then about that same time, we realized that even though everybody were talking about MQTT, nobody had come up with a standard way of coming up with a topic namespace and a payload representation. So that's when we created the, the Sparkplug specification. And then 2018, we donated the, all of the IP and all of the reference implementation code to the Eclipse Software Foundation. So let's go through the basics. We need, there's two things we have to have for a MQTT infrastructure. First thing we have to have is a client. So what does a client do? A client basically establishes an MQTT session with a server. It creates that remote originated connection into a server and says, hey, can I connect to you? Server says yes. So I'm connected. And now I'm going to issue subscriptions to topics that I think I would be interested in as a client. And at that point in time, I can also publish information on an MQTT topic that I think other people would be interested in. And during this whole time, I've got to take, make sure that I keep my proper Keep Alive messages so that people know that I am online and I'm available to publish information when need be. So that's basically the simplicity of an MQTT client. Now, an MQTT server, or sometimes referred to as a broker, the broker is responsible for the authentication and authorization of clients that want to connect to the infrastructure. Once that connection has been established, then creating that session with the client. Now, an MQTT server receives all the messages being published, and it registers subscriptions to clients that have subscribed to topics, and then it routes those messages to those clients that have been subscribed to that. Uniquely, a, an MQTT 3.1.1 uh, server needs to be able to guarantee in order delivery of messages. In other words, this isn't just IT where we're going to take a piece of data and a timestamp and put it up into a database. This is that I want to make sure that if that valve state went from open to closed, that those two messages are indeed delivered in, 
in order delivery so I don't get those messages out of sync with each other. And the MQTT server is responsible for monitoring all of the clients that are connected to it. And any, if any of those fall off the TCP IP network, it's responsible for publishing that client's last will and testament. We call it the death certificate, i.e. my node out in the, in the field, out, out monitoring an oil well, the cellular network went down. Well, I need to know in real time when that event happened. Let's look at a real simple MQTT message. So we've got two clients and a server here. So we're going to have one client on the left that's going to connect, establish that MQTT session. And then the client on the right is going to do the same thing. So they're both now connected to the same MQTT infrastructure. Now, one top one client is going to subscribe. And for this simple example, he's going to do a wildcard subscription that says, hey, I want to subscribe to anything that comes through this MQTT server. The right side client says, oh, I think I want to publish something. So it comes up with a topic. It's going to publish on hello slash world. And that payload is going to be an ASCII string. It's going to say hello from a client. I'm going to publish that over MQTT, and that arrives at the server. Well, the server looks at that, and he processes it, and he says, hey, is, any, is anybody subscribed to the topic of Hello World? Well, we have a client here. He's subscribed to everything, so we're going to take that message, and we're going to deliver it to him in real time so that that client now sees that a message just arrived. The topic is Hello slash World, and I've got an ASCII payload called Hello from a Client. So it's a real simple but yet that is the basics of MQTT. So a little bit more expanded example of the anatomy of an MQTT infrastructure is that we have this notion of edge clients and edge clients could be something like Ignition Edge connected to RTUs and PLCs and flow computers out in the field. And it's going to come online, it's gonna create that MQTT session by connecting to a central MQTT server. Now notice that is a remote originated connection in huge uh, uh, aspect of security and why that's good, but we'll go through that more in a little bit. So once that connection is established, I'm gonna subscribe to things that I'm interested in. And if I'm an edge client, I'm probably interested in commands. And then I'm going to start publishing data whenever a process variable changes from any of the devices that I'm connected to. Now notice that there's no other applications connected to this, but I can still publish. I don't need to know who's gonna consume my data. I can just publish data as it changes over the IP network. Now, we have another client that's gonna connect the host client, say running on Ignition, and it's gonna establish that MQTT connection. It's gonna to subscribe to information that it's interested in. And as soon as that happens, those process variable tags that are being published by the edge client are consumed by the host client. If that client had never been, that edge had never been seen before, those tags would automatically be created, or those spark plug messages would automatically create tags within the ignition platform. So now uniquely, and one of the unique aspects of MQTT is that now we can have multiple applications subscribing to the same data that's being published. So now we've got an automatic real-time one-to-many data architecture. Now, the well, a question that we get a lot is, well, Arlen, is, this is just by one direction. Well, no, it's not. So we have commands that can be published. And this is, once you've got these sessions established, this is a bi-directional communication path. Now, we'll go through access control lists and say, well, you shouldn't let anybody send a command. But that's how command and control is accomplished using MQTT. So as we build out the infrastructure, we add clients that publish interesting information, we have clients that subscribe to that interesting information, and we end up with a secure, one-to-many, real-time SCADA architecture. Now, as we talked through all this, we talked about MQTT, how dominant it's become, uh, how everybody uses it within the IT space, whether you're talking about Azure or, or AWS IoT or Google Cloud Platform or IBM Watson IoT, they are using MQTT messaging. But looking out at the industry four years ago, we realized is that everybody was doing it differently. So every time they started up a project, we, they would sit down and go, oh, well, let's come up with this topic namespace. Well, let's come up with this JSON uh, data representation or this XML data representation. 
Well, what that meant is, is that although we had all of these cool MQT2 tools, we had no plug and play capability. In other words, it seems like we were starting from scratch every time. So what Link did here four years ago is we sat down and said, look, we've got 75, 80 man years of experience. We've been doing this a long time. We've got lessons learned. We can tell you all kinds of stories about how we did this project or that one. Well, let's take that. And let's define how best to use MQTT in a mission critical real time environment. So, simply all the Spark Plug spec is, is these three things it defines an OT centric topic namespace that makes sense in SCADA. In other words, we've defined a topic namespace so that I don't need to know what company made that device, as long as they followed the spark plug spec, I can automatically learn about that device, I can learn about its metrics, and I can learn about all of the process variable tags by knowing what to subscribe to. The second thing we did is we defined an OT-centric payload that made sense for publishing process variables, temperatures, pressures, flow rates, flow computer uh, information. Now, in the IT world, Everybody were using JSON, and that's great. But you real, we, everybody realizes in the OT world, we don't have free and unlimited bandwidth. We're constrained to radio networks and, and, and VSAT networks and cellular networks. And even on the factory floor, we've got to be careful with bandwidth utilization. So what we did was we came up with a, uh, a it's called Google Protocol Buffers, that let us take process variable centric information called metrics and put those on the wire binary but then be able to take them off and explode them into JSON very easily. The third thing the spark plug spec does is it defines this state management that's automatic, that's already built into MQTT, but very few people actually took a look at. So we define what happens when a edge of network device in a factory or out in an oil well or on a booster station or on a water wastewater, we define what happens when that falls off when it publishes this last will and testament, and the fact that when an ignition gateway or other subscriber sees that death certificate, it now knows that that device is offline, and therefore all of the tags underneath that device should be staled. Now, what that provides us then is tag metadata. So now when I get a tag, it's not a register and a value. It's not 40,001 with a value of 12. When I get a tag, it has a millisecond timestamp, it has a name, maybe it's called suction pressure, it has engineering units, maybe those are PSI, engineering ranges, zero to 100. All of that is automatically provided when we publish metrics using Sparkplug. It supports the stateful connectivity for control. We have auto discovery of everything from devices all the way down to tags, all the way down to engineering units, and basically, it gives us that thing that we've been looking for, that single source of truth at the edge of the network so that when I discover something, I don't have to edit it in this application and edit it again in another application and edit it again and hope from a human standpoint that I edited that tag correctly in all those places. Now with Sparkplug, we also get the ability to do store and forward. So that's huge in that, you know, it's funny, four years ago, before we came up with Sparkplug, if your network went down, you lost data. Well, today, we can basically provide zero data loss even as the network goes up and down because we've got the ability to take these messages, store those, and when the network comes back up, be able to slowly feed those back out into our data historians. So with Sparkplug, the concept of a single source of truth for OT information can finally be realized. Now, from that Spark Plug spec, again, we made it open. It's now it's out there. It's in the Eclipse Software Foundation. And the adoption of, of OEM devices, of services, things like Canary Labs, OSI Soft, uh, Pi, all of this, this ecosystem has basically put, put together in less than three, the last three and a half years of people that have equipment that we can go get and it's applicable to our industrial control systems and we can apply it. So if we look at what are the components of an MQTT architecture, when you look at them in the light of the Sparkplug specification, on the left, we have this notion of host clients. And on the right side, we have this notion of edge clients. And in the middle, we have this notion of we could have one MQTT server or as many as we need 
to keep the availability and the reliability that, that we need for the system that we're trying to put together. So uniquely MQTT host clients can connect to all MQTT servers that are in the infrastructure, while edge clients connect to any one of N MQTT server that's in the infrastructure. So from the edge, which is predominantly data producers, although you can send commands and you can send data the other direction, up to applications that subscribe to that data, up to services then that can consume that information. Now, if we look at typical edge clients and type of edge clients, we start looking at that ecosystem that we're starting to see evolve out there. And we can see that for gateways like running Ignition Edge on, on Logic or Advantech, we have native devices like OIGO, PLC, Opto22, Easy Automation. So now we can get data from PLCs and sensors from right from the origin all the way into Sparkplug natively into our infrastructure. We've got edge clients that can plug in, as Kurt said, that can plug into Ignition already at the plant. So we have a lot of customers that are literally plugging transmission into an Ignition system, exposing hundreds of thousands of tags into MQTT infrastructure for other applications to consume. And then, of course, a huge source of data for us is OPC UA servers like Kepware and Matricon, where we can plug in MQTT transmission and take all of those OPC UA tags and be able to publish those with augmented source of truth. If you want to add it at that level, be published using Spark Plug B. Now that we've got this, we have this notion of redundant networking. So we talked about, you know, secure, redundant, highly available architectures. Whereas if you look at Philips 66, when we started on this, they had basically three networks at, at, at a lot of their booster stations. They had dial-up, they had VSAT, they had cellular. So they had three communication paths out into one of eight MQTT servers. And from that, you know, four to five nines availability. If you have rain fade on the VSAT, the MQTT client can automatically say, oh, well now I've got connectivity over cellular, be able to connect back into my MQTT infrastructure for redundant network. From an edge client standpoint, so again here we can have a primary and a secondary hardware. So Ignition Edge and Ignition both fully support primary backup hardware situations where if I have a case where an Ignition Edge box would stop working, then the backup immediately takes up, recreates the connection back into the servers, and it starts pulling the devices out in the field. The same for, let's say, an ignition gateway that might be at the edge of a plant where it's got all of this information coming in, the primary system goes down, the backup immediately takes up, MQTT transmission knows about all the redundancy capabilities of ignition and does that automatically. From a host client standpoint, it's actually pretty straightforward at this point. If this is our primary uh, uh, control, command and control system, Basically, the same applies. We have a primary and a backup system, both with MQTT engine. Engine knows which system is live, and it knows to make the connection into the server infrastructure to subscribe to all that information. And then if it, the primary comes back up, it switches back up and reestablishes the connections it needs into the MQTT infrastructure. Now, if we look at you know, what, where would you place your MQTT servers? One of the questions that came in is, should, we, should they be on-prem? Should they be in the cloud? Well, I think the answer is all of the above. So with private on-prem solutions, of course, you as the customer get to manage all your software and your hardware. You can put in redundant configurations based on how your uh, private internal network is. Uh, there's no recurring costs for that. And you can use on-prem MQTT servers or any other for Ignition or any other MQTT enabled system. Now, as people get comfortable with the cloud and be able to basically be able to run MQTT servers in like EC2 containers or any sort of container up on the cloud, well, we get to take advantage of the fact that that's instantly scalable. That gives us that redundancy and being able to run MQTT servers in multiple availability zones and multiple regions. We could grow and, and, and compress very, very quickly. There is monthly reoccurring to worry about there. Not high, but there, there is 
cost for running on those containers. And again, we can use it for ignition or any MQTT enabled system. And then a lot of what we're seeing today is the hybrid approach where I have use cases where I do need MQTT servers on-prem, but I also can have them available to me in the cloud. So a, a great for emergency backup and redundant for high availability. As people learn about virtual private cloud and how to apply, best apply uh, security, I think everybody's becoming comfortable with the security aspects of that. So you basically get the both solutions of being able to use both on-prem and cloud-based MQTT servers. Now with Sparkplug, we've defined the fact that an edge client can connect to any one of N MQTT servers. So if you look at this and you think about redundancy and how we've done it over the last 35 or 40 years, this is simple. I mean, we lose one network, we, or we lose one MQTT server, we switch to the next one. We lose that one or that network goes down, we switch to the next one. But you can see how simple, I guess you could look at it from, it's elegantly simple in having server redundancy for any client that's out in the field. Now, as we talk about security, you know, one of the things we go through this and I go, Arlen, what were, you, what were you and Andy thinking when you guys invented MQTT? I mean, there is no security in the MQTT specification. And that is correct. MQTT though, sits on top of TCP. So really we're leveraging all of the TCP IP technology out there for the security of MQTT. Now, the first thing I'll point out very quickly here is that all MQTT socket connections are remote originated. That means that I don't need to know the IP address, I don't need to know the port number for those devices out in the field. It is going to create a remote originated connection into my MQTT server. So if you think about that, think about in typical SCADA systems, you've got to know hundreds, if not thousands, of port, address, uh, port numbers and TCP IP addresses. And you've got to create firewall rules and you've got to connect outbound to all of that infrastructure. Whereas with MQTT, simply you have one port to manage if you're using TLS and everybody makes a connection into that. With TLS, of course, we can use certificates to both authenticate as well as to encrypt communications. Now at the application level though, MQTT does have username and password that we highly recommend are used and they have access control lists. Most MQTT servers, although access control lists are not part of the MQTT specification, they're an adjunct to it that let us set up groups and say, okay, if this is your username and this is your password, then you can publish on this topic. So a good example of that is that if I have test and dev connected to the same in infrastructure that I have production, I can put in an ACL that says test and dev cannot publish on the command topic. And now I can run test and dev and development, both looking at live real-time data coming into the system. From a edge security standpoint, we look at that again, no inbound ports are required to be open. We start by creating a socket connection using TLS over the network to where our MQTT servers sit. At the MQTT server side, we only need port 8883 open. We have TLS wrapped around those servers as well as the username and password authentication. And then within that infrastructure, we use access control lists to, to control who can publish and subscribe to that. Now on the host, basically it's the same thing is that on the host side, we only have to have one port open with TLS, with username, and with access control list. So if we look at that end to end, it becomes very simple. We open up port 8883, we make a remote originated connection into our infrastructure. You can see here that we've almost created this, this well it is, we've created a DMZ at the MQTT server level where there's no way to get from the edge device or from the internet or from even the corporate network through this into your field side. So again, it's so easy to start adding and commissioning these devices out. You still have that one port open and it's secure and it's simple.
And I always like the, let's try to keep it simple, stupid principle of, let's put these things out there, let's make sure they scale, but let's keep it simple. And final thing we're gonna go over through is that, let's look at failover and redundancy. So right here, we have a happy network. We have some edge clients connected to some MQTT servers, and we have our primary host client up at the top, could be Ignition or other very important application that's receiving those MQTT messages. So the first thing we'll look at is a server failure, and we have a server fail. Well, this is pretty self-evident. Those edge clients are gonna know, oh, that server's no longer there. We're gonna look around and we're gonna connect to another available server. So now everybody's happy again. All the edge clients are connected into an MQT server. That information is flowing up. Now that other server that went offline, it comes back online and then it's available again to, for somebody that wants to connect to it. The next scenario we'll look at is a primary network failure. Now in this case, this is a little bit different because for all practical purposes, this edge client is now quite happily connected to an MQTT server. But it's publishing information that is not getting to our primary host that could be lost. So this is part of the spark plug spec is that when that primary connection is lost, that edge client is in, knows about it immediately. So he knows he needs to disconnect from a server that's not connected to a primary data consumer and connect to one that is. Now, once that network's reestablished, again, over the course of time, these people can come back and now, Again, we have a happy network. We have all of our edge clients connected to their brokers with the application consuming it. And the last scenario is a primary host failure. So as we were talking about before, we lose a primary host and all of the edge clients know immediately, look, let's go into store and forward mode. Let's save any message that might be lost. So they're store and forwarding those messages as they come on. Now that primary host comes back online and slowly, by not creating a data storm, slowly, all of those queued messages get published and those all get pushed into the data historian, resulting in zero data loss during a pretty catastrophic failure. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of this and we're gonna go into an actual demo. Uh, we've got an ignition gateway running on an EC2 instance on Amazon. We've got three available MQTT servers. And we've got all these devices that are in our lab here at SiriusLink already connected in. And we've got around 1,400 simulated devices. So we can see what you know a, a fairly loaded system is going to look like. So now if we come in and look at the dashboard for that ignition instance, and we go to the configuration and modules. We can see this is a pretty typical uh, installation. We've got all of the standard modules, but down here we've got MQTT Engine module installed. So if we take a look at MQTT Engine, we can see here that it's not enabled yet. That's important to note. But if we look at our servers, we go in here and we edit one, we can see that we can define MQTT servers that are out there, we can tell what whether we're using uh, not using uh, TLS or we are using TLS. And if we are using TLS, we've got the ability to load all of our certificates required into that client so that we can connect into that MQTT infrastructure. So we can see again here, we have three MQTT servers that we've told MQTT Engine about. These could be on-prem, these could be in the cloud, they could be in both. So now that we have that, and again, let's just note here that that MQTT engine is not plugged in yet. Let's open up our project. So this is the designer for that instance. And what we can look at here is that when I added MQTT engine to Ignition, it created a new tag provider called MQTT engine. And we should have nodes here, but if we refresh that, well, we don't have engine enabled, so it hasn't learned anything yet. So we see here that from this, we actually, here's the number of tags. So let's go here. Here's the number of tags that I know about. I know about 169 tags, and I don't know about any devices or anything else that's out there in our infrastructure. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug in and see how quickly we can self-discover devices and tags that exist within our infrastructure. So we're gonna go back into engine and enable it. 
And oops. And when I hit save here, I want everybody to note. We'll watch the tag count. We'll watch the number of devices showing up. We'll watch the transmit and receive. And you'll see here as servers come in, their state, the number of nodes, messages per second, and the latency in milliseconds. So let's save the changes. And we now know about 618 nodes, 1,400 devices, 71,000 tags, and we learned all of those in just a few seconds. So now let's go back over and refresh our edge nodes folder. Oh, now we've got, we've got a simulated factory group with nodes with hundreds of devices. We've got an IA group, Mission Edge, with a Click Modbus PLC that is providing us a tank level and a tank temperature. Now, note, we just learned that a few seconds ago, but now I could go into design mode. And the fact that I was a using spark plug, not only did I get a Modbus register that I could express as tank 115, I could give it engineering units zero to 35 centimeters. And now when I design with that tag or I put it in the template and I put that on my screen, now I've got, I self-discovered, I learned the fact that I had that tank level process variable, I know what its engineering units are, and I know that if it changes out in the field, I'm going to be immediately informed of that change, i.e. my single source of truth. Delete that and go in back into run mode. So we learned about all of these. We learned about uh, using the ignitions um, UDT structure. We can learn about interesting things here. We did a smart factory demo here just recently that had a blender and an extruder and a grind off. So I could literally go into a window, take the blender UDT, drag and drop it onto the screen and basically create dashboards on the fly. Now, really what we were talking about here, the reason for this demo is that one of the things we wanna see here is that if we look at our smart factory, and we see here that this distributor eight, we have five nodes and 250 devices that are connected into this. So what would happen if we lost that? So if we go back into our settings for our distributor, and we go into configuration and look at that MQTT server, We can see here that it is online right now. So we're basically, of our three MQTT servers, we're going to catastrophically kill one of them and see how long it takes for, first of all, Ignition to realize that those have gone offline and set those tags stale, but then be able to recover from that. So we'll disable that MQTT server, save the changes, and boom. Immediately 125 devices went offline, but oh, now they're back. Notice by using the metrics in MQTT engine, we were able to see, we'll go into our engine info, edge nodes. Oops. Refresh that. Go into our clients and we can see we have all these valuable metrics. So we literally are getting a view into our MQTT infrastructure by using tags that are coming on and offline. So we can bring the server back online. And note that we saw that pretty much immediately coming back in. So now we have our three servers back online. And notice because of Sparkplug, I can do cool things like I can go into node control and I can force nodes to next servers. So I wrote a little script for this button that basically pushes, well, we'll enable command mode here, that basically pushes these two smart factories from one set of MQTT servers to another one. So I just pushed 250 devices off of one server onto this server. And again, we'll go through one more fail where we can disable that MQTT server 
and have those 250 devices go offline, but immediately switch around and look for the next available MQTT server to connect to. So with that, I'm going. we're gonna get out of this demo. Uh, we've got several demos and all of these are available on our videos uh, going uh, if you wanna look at them um, and look at some of the other self-learning aspects that we've got with, with Spark Plug and Ignition. So we'll go back into the webinar here. And we'll go through basically a summary of just real quick, what do we talk about and, and how do we review from the standpoint of what's best practices as far as host clients and increasing the availability, you know, having redundant networking paths, redundant ignition gateways that can be set up and utilizing primary host ID so that if hosts do go offline, we don't lose any data out in the field. Of course, we recommend using TLS for all of the MQTT connectivity and using the access control list. Understand how to best use access control list so that you can segment your clients on who can subscribe and who can publish on what topics. For MQTT servers, we showed you that it's very, very simple to increase your redundancy and your availability by simply adding very basic MQTT servers into your infrastructure. Again, those servers should support TLS, they should support unique username and classword, passwords, and have the access control list for you to set up within those servers. And then at the edge, we showed that, well, you, you want to minimize the number of ports that are open, and for just MQTT, you don't have to have any ports open. The fact that it's a remote originated connection and the fact that you can have redundant edge gateways and redundant networking paths. So if you look at all of this from a security, availability, scalability, redundancy standpoint, you can see that it's very, very easy to put together these architectures. And again, back to my point, is that let's keep it simple. Let's keep it manageable. Let's make it work very, very well. Now, finally, I'm just gonna, one, one quick note here. Uh, Spark plugs the spec. That, that we've basically donated to the Eclipse Software Foundation. And what we're starting is a working group called Tahu within the Eclipse Foundation, where we want as many uh, uh, OEMs, uh, 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 customers, service providers as possible to join this working group so that we can take spark plug the next level but have participation of everybody that's out there in other words sirius link don't want to be doing this in a vacuum by any means so you can see here there's some information on how to get to the tahoe uh, working group and it would be great if if people could sign up to the uh, working group mailing list so that we could keep you informed of what's going on there so with that, uh, I'm gonna turn this back over to Chris and uh, see if there's any questions. Yeah, great job, Alan, thank you so much. Um, just before we start on the questions, uh, just wanna draw everybody's attention. Uh, in the handout section of the webinar, we've got this MQTT recipe PDF, uh, which gives some links to getting started, downloading, running some tutorials. So I highly recommend people to download that and. Uh, Get, get started on that today. So also, um, if you wanna see any of our other webinars, go to our website, which is in the bottom right corner, cirrus-link.com. We have a resources page where we have uh, tutorials, videos, um, all our documentation. So that's a really good source of information if you wanna learn more about this. So let's have a look at some questions. There have been a lot of good questions come in. So uh, I think this first one's for you, Arlen. Um, aside from its lightweight two-byte header, why has MQTT started to grow as the industry preferred protocol for sending messages? Uh, <laughs> I, again, it's, it, you know, keep it simple. Um, you know, I talk a lot to, if I talk to universities and, uh, you know, why is the MQTT so used? The spec, if you think about it, guys, the spec is 18 pages long. It's easy to implement, it's easy to validate, and it does what it needs to do and it does it very efficiently. If you look out at the community, uh, 
MQTT isn't relegated just to OT. You know, it's not like the the, the DF1 protocol or HARP protocol or D, you know, Allen Bradley protocols over in, in this cubicle seven is the only guy in the company who knows how this works. MQTT comes available on the, every Raspberry Pi sold. And it, all the college kids are downloading the, uh, a, the Alexa app that lets you talk to your Amazon device, and then it'll send MQTT commands from AWS to your Raspberry Pi to turn your lights on and off. So I, I think it's the fact that it's so available and people are so knowledgeable about it, and there's so many tools out there. That's why it's become the, the kind of the dominant transport that's out there. Okay, great. Yep. Um, another one here, we would like to look at a redundant MQTT solution, redundancy for the broker software, especially as well as load balancing. I see that question come up an awful lot. So can you talk to that one? Well, you saw, you saw the, the how simple redundancy is. And, and I know there's a lot of products out there that have these uh, clustered MQTT servers. If one fails, another one picks up. But I've been doing this long enough to know that sometimes those clustering solutions are a cluster, but not the right one, right? So keep it simple. Uh, what, the, what I showed you in by using Sparkplug is you've got your host client, and edge client, and with that you get infinite scalability or infinite redundancy, if you will. Now, from a load balancing standpoint, I would not recommend that because if you're doing real SCADA, now you can use load balancing if it's just IT. But if you're doing real SCADA, one of the problems with load balancing is it tends to send messages out of order. And if you're using Sparkplug, we'll actually drop it. If we get sequence numbers that tells us that that, that load balancer is shedding MQTT messages, we're going to drop that connection because that's not safe. Uh, but what we have found in, in every situation that I showed you, we haven't hit a system yet to where we couldn't run the entire system on one MQTT server. Or what you do is you just set the limit, you, you limit the number of connections, say, okay, for this MQTT server, I can have a thousand, for this one, I can have a thousand, for this one, I can have a thousand, and that automatically does load balancing. So again, if you look at Philips, they have six or eight MQTT servers, and it is very interesting that that tends to balance, you know, the networks come up and down, things come and go, but that tends to balance out across all those servers over time. That's great. Thanks, Alan. Um, wow, this one looks like a real good sales question. So Kurt, you can hit this one out of the park for us. I have an opportunity to greenfield an OT network. I want to leverage MQTT. How do I get started? We love those. Um, so I, I guess, you know, you know, one thing you definitely call us and we can walk you through it, but I think you really need to identify the data producers and the data consumers, who's consuming the data, who's producing the data, identify the devices in the field, what the uh, protocols are, do you need an edge gateway, then understanding that connectivity, uh, understand the network paths, and then start designing your architecture if it's going to be in the cloud or on premise for the MQT servers. So you kind of, you know, start at the edge. I think another important part is your topic namespace and your data standardization of that data, uh, building standardization tools of how you can present regardless of the PLC or devices out there, coming up with a methodology to standardize UDTs or structures of data, um, but th there's a lot there to go. But I think um, just starting with what's in the field, what the devices are, what's my paths, you know, how what kind of architectures do I want to have from on-premise or in the cloud, and then if anything, um, you know, definitely give us a call. We can help that process out, and also you can start, you know, today. Not like any uh, Ignition product, you can download Ignition Edge or Ignition and download the modules from. Uh, the inductive automation website and you can go through tutorials connect and see how it starts working today so you can actually do a quick proof of concept that costs you nothing that um, we can help you through our support get up and running in minutes so you can do a, a proof of concept to start seeing the data flow and then just walk through each of those um, thought processes of how many nines of availability do i need do i need redundancy and what network paths i need to utilize that's great well, thank you very much, both Alan and Kurt. We've done a great job there, and we're out of time. So thank you, everybody, for attending the webinar today, and uh, we certainly look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you.